Well, you've heard the story. There's the bad news first and the good news. Well, I got the uh, task to give you the negative side of the message, and Blake's going to come up and bring the positive side. Because as we talk about two dominions, the negative is the dominion of darkness. When Jesus was praying in Matthew chapter 6, the Bible records the end of the message, the end of the prayer like this, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's called a doxology. A doxology is something like a short hymn of praise that goes at the end of a prayer or something else. How many of you grew up in a church where you started the church service singing what was called the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That's a great song. I mean, praise him, you know, praise ye Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I can't even remember all the words. It's been a little while. Y'all remember that? We'll sing that again. Um, because it's, it's, it's proper and appropriate to praise God. I wonder if our prayers look like that. A lot of times as we've been doing summer prayer, we talk about prayer and our prayers are more like, God, here's my wish list. Do this, do this. I'm complaining about something. And then we just skip the thing about the thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. What did Jesus mean when he said that? Same thing that John meant when he said it, and same thing that Peter said when he said it, and the Apostle Paul had doxologies on the end of his prayers. In Revelation chapter 4, in verse 11, there's a doxology. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Going on to Revelation 5, 12, same thing. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. I would encourage you this week, as you delve into your prayer time, to begin using doxologies in your prayer. Take time to praise God. Because even Jesus, when he taught us this, he said, when you pray, hallowed be your name. Praise and priorities is one of the most important things about prayer. Now, he uses the, king, he uses the term kingdom in this prayer. Thine is the kingdom. Do you all have any idea what that is? Do you know how many times Jesus refers to the kingdom in the Gospels, and yet so few times in churches do we hear people talk about that? You see, the kingdom of God is a Greek word, basileia, basileia, and it means the dominion or rule. Dominion or rule. Also can be referring to a subject, territory subject to the rule of a king. So when Jesus says... Um, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's talking about the dominion or rule of, the, of, of God's kingdom. And he said it's at hand, which means it can be, uh, you know, present here on the earth. And we find out through the teaching of the gospel that we're born into this kingdom, except a man be born again, he cannot see this kingdom. There is a very real spiritual kingdom going on right now in the world. And it is separate from the kingdom that we see most days. And what I want you to talk about today is that you're, you need to be aware of the fact that there are more than one rules, more than one authorities, and you're either subject to one or the other. It's impossible to serve two masters. It's impossible to be a part of both. You can't be a part of the, the dominion of darkness and the kingdom of light at the same time. And Jesus is calling us to live in his kingdom. Now, as we look around our world today, we see a mess, don't we? Now, y'all going to help me preach today or not? There is a mess in the world, and the mess is not coming from the kingdom of light. You see, if we would submit to the kingdom of light, the kingdom uh, that is spoken about in Matthew, the kingdom that is spoken about in the New Testament, everything in our world would look different. But the problem is, is that humans have a problem submitting themselves to God because we think we know better and we think we can do it our own way. And so from the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden and right off the bat, rebellion happened and rebellion happened because they did not want to submit to the authority of the creator. Therefore, they were cast out into darkness. And so now we have the concept of maybe two kingdoms. You'll notice on the screen it says two kingdoms because sometimes we hear it spoken of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. But I did a lot of research, and I may not have seen it, but I didn't really notice any time 
that the Bible talked about darkness being a kingdom. It's more like a dominion. In fact, darkness is, is uh, pretty well not unified like a kingdom is because there's so many different things in play. So many different types of, of uh, desires and wills. You see, when you get humans and our lust for power and, and significance and, and for our own way, you've got splintered and disunified things and it never really tries to, it never really is able to come together, but darkness tries. The Bible talks about it in Colossians 1.13 that Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. He's brought us from dominion to kingdom. From the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of light. And I'm saying this because it reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 8. When the devil took him up, took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I will give you these kingdoms of the world. You see, it's not kingdom of darkness, it's kingdoms because Satan tries to unify but never succeeds. In Genesis chapter 11, we find out in the first book of the Bible, humans trying to take kingdoms and make it a kingdom, make it a singular unit. We know that as the Tower of Babel. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember the story of the Tower of Babel? And you're like, what is the problem? I mean, all they were doing was trying to build a tower. Well, we don't know everything about what they were trying to do, but we know that they were coming together and they were, they were ambitious. They were going to build something apart from God's plan. They are going to do their own thing. And they were coming together in order to do their own thing. And God said, you know what? They are kind of together on this, so I'm going to go down and confuse their language. The point is, is that Babel started something there that has been moving throughout history ever since. In fact, the New Testament, back in the book of Revelation, calls it Babylon. What we have in the world today is a system, just like Babel, that we're going to get together, we're going to do all that we do, we're going to have success, we're going to have a kingdom that's going to stand, that's going to last, and it's going to be separate from what God wants. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the dominion of darkness. And people deal with that all the time. You see, when you choose to sin, when you choose to disobey God, then you are choosing to submit yourself to the authority of the dominion of darkness. And that's why we live in a world where anxiety is the number one characteristic trait of the young people. Guys, it's crazy. Jesus said things like, do not worry, do not fear. When you follow Jesus, you have righteousness, peace, and joy. And yet so many people who even under the couch of some type of religious experience that they think they have with Jesus Christ, they still live in those things. You're living under darkness. And everything that we see going on in the world, and I think all of us can say everything's a mess right now, and we don't know what tomorrow looks like. And the reason is is because we have gone after darkness way too long. In fact, I would dare say it like this. In the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the last 30 years, we have been more, inter uh, more interested in entertainment. We've been more interested in feel-good sermons. We've been more inter interested in not offending people that we just want to come up here and give some kind of little sermonette, send you on your way, and we go out into the world and we think that the kingdom of God is the United States of America or the kingdom of God is my materialism or the kingdom of God is my happiness. Ladies and gentlemen, none of those things are true. And the reason why the United States of America is in decline is because we have neglected the kingdom of God in our country. You see, the kingdom of God is what will give the ability and the power for our country to stand another 250 years. But don't think that it'll be here in 250 years. I told you I was on the negative side of it today. I want to alert you to the fact that Babel is still going on. People are still trying to gather and unify and, and gain and build a kingdom apart from what God wants. And they're using the world's methods. I don't have a whole lot of time because I'm the introduction, but I want to give you this. The dominion of darkness desires to be a kingdom. Therefore, it, always, it is always attempting to unify, glorify, and magnify itself. Social media has been a big part of this. 
Social media has been a huge part of this because in social media you get all kinds of stupid ideas. I, I wish I could preach to you a little while today. I'm reading a book called Irreversible Damage. It's, it's written by a lady who's not a Christian, uh, but she's talking about how that social media is getting behind the scenes of parents and speaking. She's, the book's about how social media is speaking to our young girls, convincing our young girls that maybe they're not girls, that they're boys. And then you have the big education of, of, of our uh, society that basically says parents don't have the right to determine whether or not their uh, junior high girl goes to get hormones to begin to transfer. Guys, this is happening. It's already the law in California, and it's coming to a state near you. And the reason is, and I'll say this often, and Blake's going to say it as well, is because in the church, in the kingdom, we have not appropriated the power of the kingdom. We've lived for ourselves. We've kind of lived a little bit for the kingdom, a little bit for the world, and you can't do it both ways. You can only go after one or the other. I want to give you quickly, I want to give you quickly, and then a story, and then I'm done. But I want to put it on the board. This is what I see happening in our country right now. This is what's happened while the church has been asleep. Take a look. We call it the Big Seven. The Big Seven is the things that are going on right now in our country that is a part of Babylon that is attempting to bring this country back into bondage. And if we as, the, as people of God don't come back to submission to the kingdom of God, we'll lose. You say, well, that's not so bad. Well, none of us have ever lived under communism. So don't tell me how bad it is because none of us ever has. And yes, it's true, the church can flourish under communism, but why would we want to do that when God gave us freedom? Right now, we're, we're able to do whatever we want in the name of Jesus. We're able to go to any country we want to go to to, miss, to do missions, to do the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but that can all change. And the reason it changes is when people are lazy, when people do not seek the kingdom of God, when we decide that our will, our desire, our, our comfort, our safety comes first then we lose. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to take action, and we, we're going to show you how to do that in a minute. The big seven looks like this. Let's just put the whole thing up there, Michael, if you don't mind. It starts with big government. Go ahead and fill those all in. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on them, but this is what's controlling things in our country. You know why the government gets bigger? Let me just say this. How does the government get bigger? By giving you things to make you dependent upon them. You're like, oh, this is great. This is coming from God. No, it's not. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. That's what it says. So we've got big government that, that, that is supported by big military. Did you ever wonder why they wanted to defund the police? Because if you defund the local police, then you have a national police that can do the will of the big government. See, right now, here where we are, we have great authorities right here. We have great police force. We have great people. We have great local government. But see, in the big government, we want to get away from the local control and nationalize it. Also, there's big medical. Do you realize now you're not in control of what you decide to do? Do you realize that? Some hospitals and some doctors can only give you certain medicines. Did you know that? I had a doctor tell me if he prescribed a certain thing for a certain medical thing that's going on right now because somebody else at big medical says it's against the law, he could be fired on the spot. Is that crazy or what? This is what's going on. Then we've got big companies. Did you realize when we shut down last year, who was open? Wasn't the mom and pop places, was it? It was the big places. How did that happen? Then you got big education. Do you realize when you send your children to university now, the first thing they're going to find out, Pastor Blake can back this up because it happened to him, the first thing you're going to find out is we're not for God. And we're going to get your faith in God away from you. Why is it? It's because what Karl Marx said. We've got to get rid of religion because if people believe in religion, they won't believe in the state. And you think the government's not against re uh, the Christian religion? You need to pay attention. You've got big education. It's supported by big media. Big media controls the thought in our country. Then from big media down to on a personal level to big tech. Do you know that the big tech platforms that all of us are on can censor any one of us at any moment? Do you realize that this is all coming from big government, guys? Evil is working in our country, and the reason why this is happening is because the power that can resist it and restrain it, we've, we have walked away from it. We need to change. I want to close with a story. 
The man's name was Laszlo Tokish. He was a pastor of the Hungarian Reformed Church in Romania in the 80s. 1987, he became the pastor. Now, Romania was communist at the time. Laszlo took the church as a pastor and right off the bat began to disobey the government's edicts. See, you may not realize it, but Christianity is illegal in communist societies. So if this happens in our lifetime, we're going to have to decide, are we going to serve this or are we going to serve God? I want to tell you, if you choose to serve God, you're going to win. It may cost you something, but you're going to win. So Laszlo Tokish started preaching again. He started uh, dusting off the, the Bible. We see in the time of Romania under communism, Nikolai Ceausescu, it's a hard name to say, he was the dictator and the, the uh, churches had to register with the government. Does that sound familiar? The churches had to register with the government and the churches had, had to submit to what the government said that they could sing. The churches had to sing the praises of the dictator. The churches had to uh, toe the party line. Ladies and gentlemen, a few years ago, the city of Houston subpoenaed the pastors of their churches to see what type of sermons they had been preaching so that they weren't preaching offensive sermons. That's the city of Houston, Texas. Guys, this stuff is here now. Well, Pastor Tokish is like, I'm here to serve the, the Word of God. So he began to preach the Word of God. You know what? His church grew to 5,000. 5,000 people in the city of Timisoara, Romania. The government didn't like it. So the government did everything they could to get him to shut up. He wouldn't shut up. So finally they decided we're, gonna, we're not going to kill him because if we kill him, we're going to make him a martyr. We'll just kick him out of his house. And they came to kick him out of his house, and they said, next Friday on the 15th, you're going to be gone. So Laszlo got with his church, and he told his church, he said, look, I'm going to be removed from my house by force next, next Friday. You know what happened? The community showed up. The church showed up. And you know what eventually happened? They stood there. They lit candles at night. It went through the night. The mayor came in. The military came in. Everybody tried to get them to disperse. They wouldn't disperse because they were standing for the truth and for what was right. And you know what ended up happening? Eventually, the police realized that they were going to have to get violent and stop it. Well, they tried. But by Christmas of that year, the dictator was out of power because the power of the church is stronger than the power of Babylon. Ladies and gentlemen, we can do this, but we have to seek first the kingdom of God. Would y'all make Pastor Blake welcome as he comes? Come on. The scary man's gone now. We can have some fun. <laughs> so let's just be honest about the world we live in. Okay? You, you see on the screen, here's what's happening in the kingdom of Babylon or call it the kingdom of America, or just call it the world's kingdom to make it easy, all right? Here's what's happening. And chances are, you looked at it, and you either said, that's exactly right, I agree with that. That's the problem. Or, perhaps, you come from a different persuasion, and you say, actually, no, the world is screwed up, but those things aren't the problem. Maybe you think there's different problems in the world. And here's where I want to go today, because what I see happening in the church is that we are all fighting, and there is a battle raging, but none of us seem to agree on who the enemy is. And most of us today are on social media. If you're not, good job. You're not missing a whole lot. But most of us who are on social media, we're scrolling, and can we, can we just confess today that the more of that we consume, the angrier and more miserable and the more anxious we get? I mean, isn't... Uh, it's just like, no, I never walk away from it and go, Lord, thank you for that time with you today. Now, now that I'm angry and upset, I'm ready to tackle my day for the glory of Jesus. Usually, we get on there, and we just make a mental list of who our enemies are. We look at the world system, and we determine this politician, this party, this group, of th this social group, these are the enemies. And then when I look at my friends, these are the ones who agree with me that these are who the enemies are. And then I look at some of my friends... And they disagree with me, so I'm going to put them in the group of my enemies too. And if we could all just agree that I'm right and they're wrong, and we could all band together and change their mind, then the world's kingdom would work, and we would be in harmony, and things would work again. And things could get back to normal. But the truth is, there is a problem in that methodology, and I want to share it with you today. 
that person and those people and those groups of people that we think are our enemy, the Bible says that's not actually our enemy. I want to take you to a scripture, but I want to remind us first, when we look at what Pastor Brian has presented today, and we say, okay, Pastor, I think you're right, and we've got a big problem. Or we say, okay, Pastor, I actually think you're wrong, and we've got a big problem. Can we all at least agree on one principle, that the world is screwed up and needs help? Can we all agree on that? All right? You don't have to think Pastor Brian's right. I often don't, but we work together anyway. I'm, that's a joke. That's an awkward laugh, all right? That's one. I, I get three offensive shots at Pastor Brian. Every sermon, that's one. I got two more. I'll warn you next time. Whether or not you agree, the truth is we can all look at the world and we can agree that there's a big problem. And we can all agree that the truth is found in the Word of God. At least I hope you can agree with that. And we can go to the Word of God and we can figure out what step we need to take. But the first thing we got to do is we got to figure out who the actual enemy is. Because if we're fighting the wrong enemy, we can't win the battles. And we definitely can't win the war. We remember who our enemy is. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says it like this. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Notice right there, number one, it says we don't fight, period. It doesn't say that. See, the answer to all of this madness and chaos in the world, hear me today, church, is not that we bury our head in the sand, that we make ourselves ignorant of what's happening in the world. And it's easy to do that. It's easy to look at the chaos and say, you know what, this is too much, it's too painful, it makes me too anxious, I get too worried when I look at it, so I'm just going to shut the TV off, shut the phone off, and I'm never going to pay attention to what's happening. I would encourage you not to do that because the Bible doesn't tell us that we need to remove ourselves from the world. Jesus said that we are to be in the world, just not of the world. So we do know what's going on. And when we see untruth and when we see error, it is the Christian's responsibility to address it. But let's remember this morning who our enemy actually is. It's not those people. It says in Ephesians 6, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. You see, church, if we were to change the minds of every person who disagrees with us, but we never got behind the veil and actually got at the real problem, which is the darkness that motivates what's happening out there, we haven't won. Getting somebody to change their political or social affiliation is not the gospel. The gospel is getting past these things and getting through these things and watching Jesus work from the inside outward. And if we attack it from the outside in, we'll never get to the real issue. Which takes me to point number two. We fight spiritual battles with spiritual weapons. Once again, we do fight. We are not passive people. We do not simply wait around for God to do something without us taking action. But when we fight, we know who our enemy is, and it's not the people. If you're attacking people, you're part of the problem. If you're attacking people, you're part of the problem. We fight spiritual battles with spiritual weapons. It says in Ephesians 6, 13, the very next verse, it says, Therefore, because our enemy is actually not the people, but it's the spiritual realm behind the people, it's the dominion of darkness that Pastor Brian talked about, because our enemy is spiritual, when we fight these battles, we fight with spiritual weapons, not physical weapons. The Bible says that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It's not wrong to be angry. When you see injustice in the world, when injustice is done to you or injustice is done to another, it's right to be angry. Amen? There is a righteous anger. But if it's fleshly anger... If it's bitter anger, if it's anger that comes out in ugly ways and in offensive ways, in ways that attack people and not the dominion of darkness behind the people, what you're doing is you're attacking a spiritual enemy with a physical weapon. And it will never work. It says, therefore, because our enemy is unseen and spiritual, we put on every piece of God's armor. So you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. If you feel like the world's beating you up, if you're in this place today and you're worn down and you're exhausted emotionally and physically, I want to encourage you, change your strategy. Change your strategy. Change your strategy. 
If you want to know about the armor of God, I want to encourage you to read and study Ephesians chapter 6. It speaks to the weapons that God has given us to defend ourselves against the evil darkness in the world system. And it speaks to the offensive weapon God has given us, which is the sword of the Spirit. And the Bible calls that the Word of God. Church, did you know that our opinions are fleshly, earthly weapons fighting a spiritual enemy? Did you know today that what I think about what's going on in the world, yes, it's important to me, and yes, you may agree with me. But the truth is, my opinion seems to get lost in a sea of opinions. Can we just all agree today that there are enough opinions in the world? If you want opinions, you will not have any trouble finding them. If you want my opinion, you can ask me. I offered that up last night, and not one person came to me and said, what's your opinion with what's wrong in the world? I was offended and shocked. Because I really thought everybody would want my opinion. But what seems to be the case is that everybody already kind of recognizes, listen, there's enough opinions out there. Everybody's got them. And none of them seem to be doing anything. In fact, isn't it crazy when you look at what's happening in the world and you have your own opinions and you share them and it seems like nobody's listening? You're like, what's wrong with people? Why don't you agree with me? The truth is, you're fighting a spiritual battle with a physical weapon. Your opinion only goes so far. But the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, is the weapon that God has given you to fight these battles. I had a young lady. She's here today. I'm not going to share her name because I don't want to embarrass her. But right now, she's fighting a spiritual battle. She is speaking with a person who's not a Christian. And she came to me and she said, Pastor Blake, I want you to help me put together some information that I can give to this person because I want him to know who God is. And I think that's a great battle to fight. Amen? That's the way to do it. And I encouraged her. I said, listen, you share your testimony. You share your story. You share your opinion. But above all, get the scripture to this person. You give the word of God to this person. Because church, my opinion, your opinion, yes, it's important. But it's not ultimate and it's not final and it's not infallible. We can't always guarantee that I'm right. But what I can guarantee is that when the word of God goes out, Isaiah says that it never comes back void. You want to swing a sword that's going to hit its mark, you put the Word of God on these situations. You start speaking the truth of Scripture, and you'll start hitting your mark, and you'll start winning some battles. I want to talk about strategy for a moment. Anybody here from Kentucky? Any Kentucky folks here? Okay, about 5% of the room. See, I come from a place with a whole lot more corn and a whole lot fewer taxes. Graves County, Kentucky. In Graves County... Praise God. Hallelujah. In Graves County, there are two big high schools in Graves County. There's Graves County High School and there's Mayfield High School. Now, in western Kentucky, Graves County, if you want to play football, you go to Mayfield. If you want to play basketball, you go to Graves. But here's the weird thing. Growing up, I used to, I watched this. I I didn't go to either of these schools. I went to a little Christian school, but I would go to these games, I would watch the football games, and Mayfield would dominate. But yet when I'd watch basketball games, Graves County would dominate. And I always thought this was interesting because during warm-ups, and if you're not a sports fan, I apologize. Just turn your ears off. I'll be back in a minute. All right? But I used to go to these basketball games growing up. And my dad's here. He can testify to this. Mayfield had all the athletes. They were all about 6'6 or taller. And in warm-ups, they would come out, they'd be bouncing it off the backboard, dunking it behind their heads, and you would watch them in warm-ups and think, my goodness, this team is going to run Graves County off the court. And Graves County would run out, and I won't disparage them too much, but they all looked like me. It's what they looked like. The point guard looked like me, the center looked like me, the backups looked like me, and the coach looked like me. And they would be out there in warm-ups, doing layups, doing three-man weave, doing bounce passes. I mean, you're just looking at this thinking, these guys are about to get run off the court. And when the whistle blew, all the guys that looked like me on Graves County, they would go out there and they had a strategy. They knew they could not play with these other guys athletically. So what they did is they took advantage of the rules. There's no shot clock in high school basketball, so they would just hold the ball. And their offense would go for about six minutes at a time. Most of the fans would sleep through the first three quarters. And at the end of the fourth quarter, the score would be like 18 to 14. Really low-scoring, boring game in Graves County. Always won. Now, I hated it as a kid because it was boring. But looking at it as an adult, I understand it now. 
they recognized the nature of the battle that was ahead of them and they employed a strategy and their strategy was this we know what our strengths are and we know what our weaknesses are and we know what their strengths are and we know what their weaknesses are and we know that if we don't give them the ball they can't score and that's how they won the game and it was awful to watch and every time they went to state they got run off the court but doggone it they figured out how to beat Mayfield and church here's what I see happening in the Christian world today we all recognize there's a problem we all seem to have enemies out there and we don't all agree on who they are but we all got them and the church is fighting I don't see many of the Christians that I know today in America being silent some are most of us are talking most of us are trying to fight the battles here's the problem I see we got no strategy we have no strategy we don't recognize who our enemy is we don't understand the nature of the battle we think the enemy is the people and not the power behind the people we don't understand the weapons that we need to be using so we're just taking whatever we've got which tends to be anger and anxiety and frustration and we're just exerting it on all those around us and we're hoping that we'll win and the church seems to be getting run off the court here's what I want to propose to you today if we know who our enemy is and we know the nature of the battle we're fighting we need a strategy on how we're gonna deal with what's out there because we all agree that there's a problem amen we all know that there's a problem now stick with me this is not gonna look like what you think it's gonna look like okay this is where it's gonna get distinctly Christian and it's gonna challenge you first point of our strategy there's a problem out there how do we deal with it what do we do with the kingdom of darkness this one's gonna blow your mind those enemies that we've talked about those people that drive us crazy we love them we love them we love them that doesn't make a lot of sense does it we love our enemies let me just read you what Jesus said Jesus was preaching a sermon it's called the Sermon on the Mount standing on a hillside probably hundreds or thousands of people listening to him and Jesus said You've heard it said that you are to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Isn't that how we do? Those who agree with us, we, we talk to them and we talk with them and we converse with them and we agree with them and we complain about the others with them. Jesus said, you've heard it said that those are the people that you're to love and you are to hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He doesn't simply say pray for those who disagree with you. He says when that disagreement turns into outright persecution and you begin to suffer because your enemy is on the move, he said that's the time you employ your strategy. And the strategy is not to vent on social media. The strategy is not to voice your opinion at every opportunity. Your strategy is to love and to pray for your enemies. He said, we do this so that we may be children of your Father in heaven. It's almost like Jesus is saying, hey, this isn't just a strategy. This is the only way we do it. Like, you want to be in my kingdom, Jesus says, you want to be part of the kingdom of light. Here's what you do with your enemies. You love them and you pray for them. To get specifically, the Bible doesn't simply say pray for our enemies and those who persecute us. It's pray for your leaders. Now, this one's really unpopular today. Because the truth is, and I don't want to make anybody feel awkward, but let's just be honest. Most of us either hated the previous president or the current president. It's just how the world is. All right? Most of us have an idea that if we could get the right leader in the right place at the right time, everything would be fine and everything would be good. And church, listen, I have my thoughts and opinions too. I would be lying to you if I said, you know what, I'm neutral, I'm just an observer, I got no thoughts or opinions at all. And once again, I'm going to offer this to you. If you want them, I'll give them to you. But I'm not going to do it right here. But here's what I will do. What I will tell you is that Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, that regardless of who the leader is, we pray this way. And he's been teaching us how to pray. He says, we pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity church this is what we do when we look at our leader and we say this is bad this is ungodly this is evil this is terrible this is darkness on the move we pray for that leader I want to challenge us today and this is a challenge to me too because I have done terrible at this 
for every complaint we utter against the leadership in our government. And there's a lot of it, and I understand it. For every complaint we utter, I wonder if we'd be willing to also spend as much time in prayer for them. That's hard to do, because I know what we want to do, and that's not it. But the truth is, these people are not our enemies. It's the darkness behind these people. And this battle we're fighting is not a physical battle. If we go in and remove all these leaders, do you understand that they'll just be worse ones come in right behind them? Like, whatever we think we can do to fix it outside of the realm of the power of the kingdom of God, it will not get better because we replace the people. Because where you have people, you've got problems. Because people are sinful and imperfect, regardless of their political or social affiliations. When we pray for our leaders, the power comes on. There's a story of a preacher named Charles Spurgeon about 150 years ago. He's one of the most famous preachers that ever lived. He was the pastor of the London Tabernacle. And during the days of revival where his church was growing, Charles Spurgeon had become very famous, and the London Tabernacle had become very famous. And throughout the week, tourists who were visiting London would often frequent the London Tabernacle just so they could see this beautiful building, so that they could see where the revival was happening, so that they could get a glimpse at where the power of God was at play. So middle of the week, this group of tourists knocks on the door of the London Tabernacle. Now, usually it was a janitor or it was somebody who worked there throughout the week that would answer the door. But on this particular day, a group of people knock on the door of the London Tabernacle. It's Charles Spurgeon himself that opens the door. And he welcomes these people and he said, hey, I want to show you something. Would you all like to see the heater of the church? You want to see the church's heater? They thought it was a weird question because it was a weird question. But nobody wanted to be the one to call him out. So they just like, all right, well, if Charles Spurgeon wants to show us the heater of his church, we'll let him show us the heater. It was weird, but they went along with it. And he took them through the foyer, down the stairs, into the basement. And in the basement, he took them down a hall. He opened a door, and in this room, in the basement, in the middle of the week, no church service going on right now, but in the middle of the week, in the basement of the London Tabernacle, was over 100 regular people praying on their knees. And he said, this is the heater of the church. You want to know why the power of God is hot in this place? It's because of this. You see, when we pray, the power comes. When we pray, the differences get made. When we pray, the hand of God actually moves. Let me just ask you as we get ready to close this morning, and Pastor Brian is going to come play, how many of us today want to see God move in the darkness of our culture? Anybody ready to see God move? All right then let's do this, let's do this God's way. Because let's also agree, how many agree that our way hasn't worked? My approach has not worked. My opinion has not changed. I have not changed one mind. I have not gotten one person to change their political party. Not one. And I'm a pretty, and I, I'd like to think that I'm a, I'm a salesman. That's what I do for a living. Like I'd like to think I'm a pretty persuasive guy. And not one time have I gotten somebody to say, you know what, you're right. Everything I believe about the world is wrong. Thank you for changing my mind today. Not once. But when we recognize the nature of the battle, and we know who our enemy actually is, and we employ God's strategy and not mine, and God's strategy is not that we hate and disparage our enemy, but that we love them, and we even go so far as to pray for them, even as they persecute us. When we do that, then comes the power. You want an example? Pastor Brian gave you a great one. I want to give you another one. Jesus Christ was the Son of God. From eternity past, He has existed as part of the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. John 3.16 says He was the only begotten Son of God. He was the only Son, God's God. And it says that God so loved us that he saw us in our sin that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into the world so that all who would believe in him wouldn't perish. We wouldn't lose the battle, but we'd have everlasting life. Jesus came to this earth, and for 30 years, he was a perfect man. He never sinned, although he was tempted like every other man and woman is tempted, yet he never sinned. And at about age 30, he began to minister, and for three years, He went about and all he did was love people, forgive people, heal people. And when he saw people living in error, he called it out and he gave them the truth. 
And there were times that he was angry, and there were times that he took action out of his anger, and it was always right. And we can learn from him. But even though he never sinned, he never failed, he never blew it, he was never a poor example, he was so hated for his ministry that the religious leaders and the political system of that day conspired together and they killed him. They tried him unjustly and they found him guilty of heresy. Can you imagine that? Finding the only begotten son of God guilty of speaking wrongly about God? Unbelievable how backwards they had it. And they hung him on a cross, one of the most brutal forms of torture and death the world's ever known. And as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he hung there. It says his body was so mangled that he didn't look like a man anymore. And he hung on that cross. You know what one of the last things he said was before he died? He said, God, Father, all these people that are doing this to me, forgive them. He said, they don't know what they're doing. Church, can we let God soften our hearts today just a little bit and help us to see that those people out there that are causing all this chaos, they don't know what they're doing. It's evil, but they don't know what they're doing. You say, yes, they do. They know exactly what they're doing. No, they may know partly what they're doing, but what they don't know is that there's going to come a day when they're going to stand before Almighty God and they're going to have to take account for everything they've done. And all that vengeance that we feel that we want to exact on them, God is going to exact it and infinitely more in his righteousness if they are not saved first. And church, what we must do today, if we want a strategy that works, we begin to pray for them now. Yes, we pray that God remove them from positions of power. But even more importantly than that, do we believe the gospel is good enough to save them? I mean, if we think that we were good enough to get saved but they're not that's a problem with me I'm no better than anybody Paul the very man who wrote 1st Timothy 2 2 he called himself the chief of sinners he never would have said those people out there are beyond the grace of God may we not say that either we pray for our leaders and finally today I want to encourage us what do we do We love our enemies, we pray for our leaders, and we remember our mission. Church, did you know that there actually is work for us to do in this kingdom? When Jesus was getting ready to depart this world and go back into heaven, his disciples wanted from him the same thing most of us want today. How many of you would love it if Jesus right now would just show up and wipe out the evil leadership of this world and set up a kingdom and rule it with authority and power and majesty and holiness and perfection. Isn't that what we would all want? It's exactly what the disciples wanted. Jesus' own followers said, Jesus, now that you're about to leave, it is now the time that you're going to establish this kingdom? They were excited. The Romans, they got to go. The Jewish leaders, they got to go. It's time for Jesus to wipe it all out. And Jesus says, we don't get to know that. But he said... All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and you make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see, church, today our mission is not to change minds. It's to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to those people that we think are our enemies, and it's to watch God change their hearts. We don't change the minds of our enemies. We rescue them from the domain of darkness and bring them into marvelous light. Colossians 1.13 says, God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and he has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Church, that's our mission. Those people that we disagree with, take them the gospel. Take them the word of God. You would be amazed what happens in the mind of a person who has received Jesus as your Savior. You want to see somebody's mind changed? Wait until you see their heart get changed. Then minds get changed. We are not here to reform the institutions of the world's kingdom. We are here to carry out the business of God's kingdom. And the business of God's kingdom is that we take the gospel to all nations, one person at a time. And we love them.